Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel. Or if you're new here, I do videos on creepy and disturbing things. And today is episode two of disturbing things that happen to real people, also known as Can't Look Away series. On February 22nd, 2017, a man named Shane A. Schindler was caught on video repeatedly approaching what appeared to be a sleeping homeless man on a Las Vegas street corner. He loiters around the man for several minutes, approaching the figure and walking away and approaching again. He even stands over the figure and looks around before walking away yet again. Finally, he is then seen pulling out a ball peen hammer from a bag that he was carrying. He approaches the figure on the ground and aims for the head hitting two swift, violent bashes. Police showed up immediately and out of nowhere arrest him to Shane's total shock. Turns out the whole thing was a setup. Police were the ones who set up the camera and they were watching Schindler the whole time. The homeless man that was covered in blankets on the ground that the police watched Shane hit in the head was not actually a person at all. It was in fact a mannequin that was covered in blankets and placed there on the ground to look like a man that was homeless. They set it up as bait. The police were trying to catch the person that had issued three other similar attacks on real people in the months prior, which had resulted in the injuries of one man in November the previous year, the death of another man named Daniel Aldape on January 4th, and the death of another man named David Dunn on February 3rd. Each of these men who were all experiencing homelessness at the time of their attack were all attacked as they slept in the same vacant lot in this area. None of the victims had been robbed and the two victims that ended up dying both died from severe head injuries. So police decided that perhaps they could catch this person that was responsible for these attacks by setting up bait, setting up a mannequin in the same area that looked like it was a sleeping man in order to catch this person red-handed. And it worked. They caught this disturbing footage of Shane attacking the mannequin. So Shane ends up pleading guilty for the attack on a mannequin. But because he pled guilty to the attack on a mannequin, they had to drop the three other charges for his attack on real men. This seems ridiculous, of course, but unfortunately the evidence that he attacked a mannequin is only circumstantial. There was no real evidence that could link him to the attacks on real people. And it also didn't help that Shane continued to maintain to authorities that he had nothing to do with the attacks on real people, that he was aware that it was a mannequin on the ground and not a real person. And so he just says that he never was going to kill a real person. So they really couldn't get a confession out of him. So they could not charge him for the actual three attacks. Okay. How sure of you were, were you that that was a dummy? 100%. 100%. Yes. You know, before you made contact with it. Yes. Those are made to look like humans. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. When you first hit it, were you sure it was a dummy? Yes. So Shane was sentenced to eight to 20 years in prison. Though it was an inanimate object that he attacked, the courts were able to charge him based on his intent. Shane believed at the time that it was a real person. Even though he maintains otherwise, the courts did decide that he was not aware it was a mannequin. They did find some evidence against him. When they searched his cell phone, they did find two selfies of him in the area where the two men that had died were eventually found. But again, it's circumstantial evidence at best. Shane used an extremely vulnerable population of people to fulfill his own sick, violent desires. I'm glad he's in jail, but it's upsetting to say in the least that he could be out of jail in a few years time. In December 2017, weird, creepy posters started popping up in the Los Angeles area, advertising a bizarre service, the chance for men only to bathe in a bathtub full of milk, either almond, soy, or traditional, whatever that means, while an older woman watches. The poster goes on to offer the person to use her sponge, and to make an appointment, just go to batheinmymilk.com. 
Even worse, the bathroom they are in is disgusting, looking run down, filthy, and there's a rope on the floor. A rope. Combined with the very unhappy look on the man's face, this leaves us with some other very awful assumptions. So people took pictures of the flyer and started posting them online where they would go semi-viral on Twitter and Reddit. There were people that were sure that just by going to the website, you were going to get an ancient curse put on you from this creepy woman. Others speculated that the man in the photo was probably the woman's murder victim. The story behind the flyers is, surprise, it was a prank. It was done by a very committed comedian and artist, Alan Wagner. If you go to bathinmymilk.com, you'll be led to many different photos of these men in the bathtub with this same woman who is never smiling or making any facial expressions, just standing there blank faced in a white gown right out of a horror movie. But if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll find Alan Wagner's website where you can become one of his monthly donators in exchange for getting your own prank flyer sent directly to you. And the bathroom you see in the photo is not even a real bathroom. Wagner set it up in his garage. In fact, to cut costs for the project, he bought the tub at Home Depot. And when they were done, they washed the tub out and returned it to Home Depot. Ew. And yes, even worse, there really is milk in that tub, but as you could probably tell from the photos, it's pretty diluted with water. Of course, in spite of it being all a prank, Alan received hundreds of messages after the posters went up with people inquiring for an appointment. They were written so seriously to him that Wagner said that he couldn't tell if they were actually being serious and looking for an appointment for this, or if they were just playing along with the whole thing. Any inquiries he gets for appointments, he actually does give them a physical address. He tells whoever's inquiring that it is the address of the old woman in the photo, but she doesn't have a cell phone or a computer or anything, so you have to send her a physical letter. He asks the inquirer to send her a letter convincing her why they would be the perfect candidate. He didn't really give out the woman's address, of course. He actually gave out the address of one of his friends as another prank and didn't tell him. So that person will get some crazy letters. I like to break up some of these stories with uh, a, some lighthearted ones like this, but unfortunately we are going back to darkness in this next one. Daniel Shaver was staying at the Mesa Quinto Inns and Suites for a business trip on January 16th, 2016. He had invited two acquaintances to his room for drinks, and it was there that he was showing them his scoped air rifle. He had this legally as he was a pest control specialist and would use it on birds in grocery stores. Daniel, having a good time, absentmindedly pointed the gun out of his fifth story window of his hotel room which scared a witness who saw it. The front desk called the police the moment the witness told them what they saw, thinking somebody in their hotel room was pointing a gun out their window. So there was the three of them in their hotel room. One of Daniel's acquaintances left before the police arrived, but the other two, Daniel Shaver and Monique Portillo, went to the hallway only to be greeted by six officers, some of them locked and loaded with AR-15 rifles. The two were ordered to the ground, and a few minutes later, Monique was taken into custody without incident. Now, FYI, this entire incident is caught on tape because the shooter had a body cam on when this happened. So the whole thing is actually available. So this body cam footage shows that the police officers are just aggressively yelling at Daniel. So. Daniel, as we know, had been drinking with his friends and the instructions were very hard to follow as it was. So he was having a very hard time following their instructions perfectly. I would argue that even if you were 100% sober without one drop of alcohol in your system, it would still be very hard to follow instructions when there's a bunch of guns pointed right at you. On top of everything, you can hear this in the video, it's like the cops are taunting him and like daring him to mess up almost. Here's some of the body cam footage so you can see what I mean when I'm describing all this. Do not worry, I will not show the part where he actually gets killed by the officer. However, if you're very desperate to see that, there is an age-restricted video on YouTube that was actually released by the police department. So you can go see it if you want, but I will warn you, 
it stuck with me. It's really, really, really disturbing. For one thing, did I tell you to move, young man? Did I tell you to put both your hands, put both your hands on the top of your head and interlace your fingers? Take your feet and cross your left foot over your right foot. Who else is in the room? Nobody. Young man, you are not to move. You are to put your eyes down and look down at the carpet. You are to keep your fingers interlaced behind your head. You are to keep your feet crossed. If you move, we are going to consider that a threat. And we are going to deal with it, and you may not survive it. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. Young lady, shut up and listen. Okay, young man, listen to my instructions and do not make a mistake. You are to keep your legs crossed. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. You are to put both of your hands, palms down, straight out in front of you. Push yourself up to a kneeling position. I said, keep your legs crossed! Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't say this in conversation. Hands put your hands in the air! Hands up in the air! You do that again, we're shooting you. Do you understand? As you heard, the officers tell them to shut up on multiple occasions. And what's most upsetting is that they're clearly not a threat to the officers. They are both obviously about to shit their pants from fright, and they're trying their best to do what they're told. It's like the cop had already decided he was going to kill him before he even entered the building. And you didn't really see this part, but right before he actually gets killed, Daniel is crying, sobbing, and pleading for his life. He asks them not to shoot him. What happened was Daniel was completely unarmed. He was trying to crawl towards the police officers as they had instructed him to do, but the police officers like wanted him to keep his legs crossed with his hands on his head like and crawl towards. It was really, really weird. It was like they wanted him to crawl, but keep his hands on top of his head and he couldn't move. Like, it was, it was an impossible game of Simon Says. Daniel at one point reaches back to his waistband, we believe, because his shorts were falling down and he didn't want them to fall down. And he grabs at his waistband. The officer supposedly interprets this as him grabbing for a weapon and he shoots Daniel. He shoots him five times and Daniel is gone in less than a second. I see, of course, in spite of how cut and dry this is, I still see a ton of people online blaming Daniel for his own death. That he shouldn't have reached for his waist because the cops would obviously think that he had a gun. And so it was completely Daniel's fault for not following instructions. But I beg of you all to just think about this for one minute. Daniel is on the ground. He's clearly confused. He is visibly and audibly crying and sobbing, begging for his life, asking them not to shoot him. Trust me, that cop was not scared. And even if he was, Daniel was still killed for a weapon that he didn't have. That other air gun that they saw out the window was in his hotel room. He had zero things on him. And if that is not enough to convince you, Let's find out a little bit more about the background of our shooter, shall we? Philip Brailsford was previously investigated for excessive force, having slammed a teenager to the ground during an arrest before. Even more damning, he also had the phrase, you're f***ed, engraved on his patrol rifle, as well as the phrase Malone Labe, which is Greek for come and take them. I am not here to discuss whether cops in general are good or bad, but you simply cannot argue or deny that Brailsford was a bad seed. It gets worse. Brailsford was found not guilty for murder. He was found not guilty for manslaughter. The department eventually rehired him, paid for his medical expenses for the quote unquote PTSD he endured after the killing. He got to retire early on medical grounds. 
He is now living with a $2,500 a month pension and got off completely scot free. Daniel Shaver, on the other hand, had a wife and two daughters. He was only 26 years old. He grew up in Tennessee. His widow, who goes by Lainey Sweet or at The Birthing Tree on TikTok, her life is clearly devoted for getting justice for Daniel. She has videos and photos of them together as they celebrated the birth of their children and to show what a devoted father and caring husband Daniel always was. Let's break this up again. Here's a little bit more lighthearted of a story, yet still a little creepy. In just April of this year, 2021, a pair of thieves took a Big Bird costume from a Sesame Street Circus show in Adelaide, Australia. The costume is worth 160 thousand Australian dollars. The costume was stolen from the circus only to show up again a few days later. It was eerily propped up against an electrical box near Adelaide's Bonathan Park, again pronunciation, and they saw on security footage two men in dark clothing returning the costume. Upon searching the costume, there was a handwritten note from the thieves in the costume's mouth. We are so sorry, the note reads. We had no idea what we were doing or what our actions would cause. We were just having a rough time and we're trying to cheer ourselves up. We had a great time with Mr. Bird. He's a great guy and no harm came to our friend. Sorry to be such a big burden. Sincerely, the Big Bird Bandits. There's a seven news Twitter clip of the authorities inspecting the bird and it's actually a little unnerving. Someone is seen pulling apart the costume to inspect it inside and out for understandable reasons in case the bird had been compromised or altered in one way or another. It's creepy to watch the childhood friend that most of us know and love keep staring into the distance, mouth agape, while someone pulls him apart. You then see two people walk off with Big Bird in pieces. And for those of us not used to seeing Big Bird as anything other than our lively, friendly, waving nostalgia symbol, this is just quite upsetting. As far as I know, the thieves were never identified or ever found. If they ever are, in spite of their lovely apology, they could actually face criminal charges because an apology doesn't negate the fact that you still committed a crime. Although we kind of got an explanation, to me at least, their whole thing and their whole note raised more questions than answers. Like, what did Big Bird see in those days that he was missing? What did he experience and will he ever be the same? More importantly, what did those men do with it in those few days? Okay, I get it, they were having a rough time, but how does stealing a Big Bird costume cheer them up. I just, I really want to know what they did with the costume. I would personally think they would have taken video or some home movie or something and then posted it online, but maybe they didn't. Maybe, or if they did take a home movie, they never posted it anywhere because they were too afraid of getting caught. Though this story is very bizarre and in the end, pretty lighthearted. It still has a lot of mysteries yet to be answered. I'm really sorry to end this video on a sad note, but our last story is about drowning victim Marie Joseph. Marie Joseph and some of her neighbors went to the pool on June 26, 2011. It was a scorching hot day and many people went to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Pool located at Lafayette Park in Fall River, Massachusetts to cool off. There's a photo from that day showing Marie holding her friend's child as she stands in the pool. But if you look at the water, you'll see that it's super murky and cloudy. Marie decided to take the slide into the deep end of the pool and she took it very closely behind one of her friend's other kids. She glides down the slide and splashes into 12 feet deep water. Marie was not a good swimmer. Uh, some say that she couldn't swim at all, but it is likely that because the water was so murky, Marie could not see how deep it was. You can see on video footage as Marie exits the slide into the pool, Rose wants to take a big breath of air and then goes under. She rose above the water once more, but that would be the last time. Nobody noticed. The pool just went on for the day and it closed like normal at the end of the night. Her stuff was all still left on one of the pool chairs, but no 
nobody really thought much of it because people left their stuff behind all the time. Even worse, the pool opened the next day and yet again, People swam in that pool all day with Marie's body at the bottom and nobody noticed or saw her there. And then the same thing happened yet the next day. So for a full two and a half days, people were swimming with Marie's body unaware that she was in this murky water beneath them. Finally, that night, a group of teens had been trespassing at the pool for a late night swim. Marie's body had finally floated to the surface and so the teenagers called 911. So how the heck could this have possibly happened? How could somebody drown in a pool full of people but then not be noticed that she drowns and then her body just forgotten and lost in the pool? Well, the friend's kid who she had followed down the slide right afterwards, he did actually see that she hadn't come back up out of the water and he went to tell one of the lifeguards. The lifeguard told the boy that they were gonna do a pool check soon anyway, so don't worry but they never did the pool check. Other accounts say that the lifeguards told the boy that they couldn't save her because they were on their break. However, this was what was going all over the news since it you know, made the lifeguards look super bad. But if you read the district attorney's official report of Marie Joseph's case, it's actually not that cut and dry. The boy who was, you know, questioned by police as a witness, his story actually ended up not matching the security footage at all. The video footage showed that the boy actually didn't approach a lifeguard until at least one minute and 40 seconds after Marie had gone under. The footage actually shows the boy walking away from the lifeguard, not the other way around. Also, none of the descriptions that the boy gave to the police of what the lifeguards looked like matched the actual descriptions of the lifeguards that were on duty that day. The only lifeguard to vaguely remember an interaction with the boy said that he asked her if she had seen his aunt or mom and left it at that. He didn't say anything about anyone going under the water and not coming back up. So don't get me wrong, I do not blame this nine-year-old boy for Marie's drowning at all. He is just a child and should not be held responsible for this. Uh, it was definitely at the end of the day, the lifeguard and the pool staff's job to keep everybody safe in the first place, to be paying better attention and for the water to not be so disgusting and murky. But I more just say this part because it's important to kind of see how Marie drowning was completely overlooked by everybody. So now you're probably wondering about the neighbors that she was with. Didn't they wonder where she had gone? And no, because the neighbors that she went to the pool with saw Marie talking to some other friends that she knew at the pool at one point in that day. So her neighbors, when she disappeared, her neighbors had just assumed that she had went off with them. The nine-year-old boy also didn't mention it to them. So that's all the circumstances that went wrong so that she not only could have been saved if one of the lifeguards noticed, but she drowned and nobody found her. Let's talk about the actual water. The pool was murky because they didn't clean it like they were supposed to when the pool opened that season. They just kind of put clean water over the dirty water, hoping that it would get filtered out. Obviously it didn't. When they did do the 3.30 pool check and Marie had already drowned around 3.20, so they did get everybody out of the pool for the pool check and they decided that the water was too murky to swim in, but they didn't close the pool. They just closed off the deep end of the pool and left the rest of it open. So this actually was worse for Marie's circumstance because then nobody was swimming in that area. So there was even less of a chance anybody would see her. The staff did inform their supervisor of the bad water, but they just had left them a voicemail. And yeah, the lifeguards were allowing the pool to be open when it shouldn't have been. It is a rule that lifeguards should be able to see the bottom of the pool at all times. And if you can't, then nobody swam. Lifeguards are also supposed to go to the bottom of the pool and sweep the bottom of the pool every single night. They also didn't do that. Marie was only 36 years old. She had five children who had to go on without their mother. She was a cheerful and kind woman, super vivacious and always happy. Of course, a bunch of people at the pool were fired as a result and the family of Marie were able to reach a settlement with the state. The pool completely closed down following Marie's death, 
but it opened a year later after they totally revamped it. The pool was rebuilt to be safer and the deep end wasn't so deep. And then they also put all these new and extra safety protocols in place. Again, it's great, but they should have been doing all this stuff in the first place. And Marie lost her life because of it when she didn't need to. Last, just a friendly PSA. It's also really important to note that, yeah, the murky water is probably what caused people not to notice that Marie was in trouble, but also drowning is usually silent. It's not like in the movies where people are thrashing around and screaming at the top of their lungs in the water. It's actually in reality very quiet and people can't make a lot of noise. I only say that because it's really important to know in the future because it often does not look like somebody's drowning and they're drowning. That is going to be it for this part two of our Can't Look Away series. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it to the end. Thank you so much to my patrons on the screen right now, especially Colin Holmes, Deck of Cards, Creep Me Out, and Alice Paul for being in the highest tier. But of course, thank you to everybody on the screen. Okay guys, I'll see you in the next one.